Thanks very much for that in, uh, introduction. It's uh, it's really um, a a privilege to be part of this great series of, of webinars. It's really uh, a, ni a nice group of talks, and it's uh, great to be connected to that. Um, the online module series that this is part of is really great to be part of part of that. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today. So last last week we had Andy White in talking about the kind of uh, expansive cultural capacity uh, across a whole range of different species, particularly non-human primates. Today, quite differently, uh, I think we'll be talking about something which I think is safe to say is specifically uh, a cultural tradition in humans and is unique to humans. And that's the essentially storytelling and uh, telling stories. And particularly, I'm gonna be talking about cognitive biases in folklore from fairy tales to fake news. So the first thing I wanted to say really is that stories are really important to humans. So for a start, storytelling or at least a kind of narrative ability seems to be a very natural cognitive function. We, the way we organize our experiences and our perceptions, think about our own lives and how we perceive the world around us, does become essentially kind of organized into a, in a narrative sense in that we see uh, patterns of meaningful relations, uh, the way things happen over time, these essentially become narratives. So narrativity is a very natural way for human minds to work and comes very naturally to us. In terms of how long stories have been with us as a, a kind of cultural artifact, them being essentially an immaterial culture, it's very difficult to, to say, well, or impossible to say when we started telling stories. We have indirect evidence from archaeology of when uh, or where we have material cultural evidence of symbolic expression, which probably would go in hand in hand with um, narrative storytelling and be going back kind of 100,000 years. We have figures like this lion headed figure, uh, whereas, you know, we don't we can't say for sure that there's a story behind this figure, but it makes sense that there would be some kind of narrative explanation behind a narrative. Uh, a lion-headed figure, and this is from the, the Paleolithic period. In terms of stories that we actually still have within culture, uh, perhaps the oldest example is the Australian Dreamtime accounts, which probably date back about 10,000 years. So stories are very important to us in terms of the way our minds work, and also have been an important part of human culture pretty much for as long as we're aware of. They also are essentially universal. We don't really have, we're not aware of cultures within humans that don't have some kind of storytelling tradition. I'm gonna be talking about uh, folklore. Um, so in terms of what that is, definitions vary and folklorists you know, like to argue about kind of definitions. The broadly is uh, the traditions which are common to a culture, subculture or group. And this includes a whole range of different uh, kind of traditions. So all traditions such as uh, tales, proverbs, jokes, and material culture, but also customary law, rituals, celebrations, dances, food, a whole range of different things, uh, most of which I won't be talking today as I'll be focusing particularly on, on narratives, so focusing on folk tales. Kind of what, in terms of what folk tales I'm gonna be talking about, I'm taking a fairly broad approach to thinking about folk tales. So thinking of them as apocryphal stories, which are told as true. This doesn't necessarily mean that they are believed by the person telling them, but the, the nature of the telling, the kind of uh, the genre, as it were, is you tell it as a true story. Traditionally, these would be something which is transmitted orally, um, but Folk tales are actually very quick to adapt to new technology, so they're certainly not limited by that oral communication. For example, going back a few decades, uh, in the kind of late 80s, 90s, people talked about fax law because urban legends were starting to be spread around by people uh, sending faxes to each other. I'm also going to include not just traditional folklore like fairy tales that you might be familiar with, but also contemporary folklore contemporary folk tales such as urban legends and conspiracy theories and also broadening that out to include uh, fake news as well. So why, why research folklore at all, um, especially in a, from a kind of cultural evolutionary perspective? I think a key reason is it's culturally successful. We have um, examples of folk tales which are over 7,000 years old. 
that have been preserved, uh, although varying, but essentially preserved as a distinct tale for thousands of years across different countries, across different languages. Also, the, the content of a folktale cannot necessarily be explained in explicitly utilitarian terms. So while storytelling as a behavior certainly ha will have some kind of function, this, the stories themselves, it's often difficult you know, to, you can't necessarily explain them just in utilitarian terms. And because of that nature, they may strongly reflect cultural evolutionary processes, particularly the ones associated with psychology. We can also say, you know, probably not surprising coming from uh, someone in cultural evolution, we can say that folk tales evolve and that some of them are products of incredible lineages. So the, the figure here is from a paper by Jamie Tarani, who looked at the phylogeny or the evol cultural evolution of Red Riding Hood, uh, well, Red Riding Hood and also a related folk tale, The Kid and the Goats. Um, and Jamie did a, uh, a reconstructed phylogeny of these tales to show their kind of evolution. And particularly, uh, one of the things we can see from this is how it adapts to different environments. So the picture next to the East Asian section is, is, illustrates the folk tale or the equivalent of Red Riding Hood there, which is uh, has a, a tiger in place of the wolf. But is otherwise essentially the same story as one we would be more familiar with, perhaps in the European tradition of uh, Brothers Grimm and Perrault and so on. We can also say that this evolution is shaped by the selection practices of human minds and societies. Thinking about those kind of pressures, sharing this quote from Frederick Bartlett from 100 years ago. So Bartlett was kind of uh, father of, uh, you know, one of these important figures in um, cognitive psychology and cultural psychology, uh, did lots of work using folk tales on memory and schema in psychology. And his work on, in his work on narratives, he said that each event or incident in a narration possesses a certain potency of reproduction. The underpotent is omitted, the normally potent is reproduced, the overpotent is not only reproduced, but may so dominate all the rest as to change the whole course of the narration. I mean, what he seems to be describing here is essentially a kind of Darwinian process of cultural evolution. Also what he's saying, I think, in terms of talking about certain types of content being overpotent and particularly potent relates to content biases within what has been suggested in uh, cultural evolution and social learning. So a number of social learning heuristics and biases have been proposed in research. Lots of great work on uh, context biases. So people are more likely to copy from prestigious models, successful models and so on. Uh, frequency dependent biases based on conformity. And then there's also a whole range of them uh, related to biases towards certain types of content. So this is what I'll be focusing on today. So the basic idea is that humans have, uh, are disposed towards uh, attending to, remembering, and then also transmitting certain types of informational content over equivalent types of informational content. And this disposition towards certain types of content makes us susceptible to material which exploits these dispositions, even if it isn't necessarily useful and even if it's not necessarily real. So it's likely that content biases were a key selection pressure on the evolution of folk tales of all different types. So something else uh, and just mentioned briefly before I get into the kind of research I'm discussing, because a number of different studies use this kind of uh, design is a transmission chain design. So this was uh, an experimental design pioneered by Frederick Bartlett, although earlier examples do exist, but Bartlett really uh, pioneered it with its use in terms of vignettes and uh, related to folk tales. And essentially this design resembles the children's games Chinese Whispers or telephone or broken telephone, where the original material is provided to the first set of participants and then, then they reproduce this typically from memory. And then that reproduction becomes the material for the second set of participants and so on down a chain of participants. And this is a really nice design because it allows us to examine the processes of uh, transmission. So thinking about what is remembered, uh, we can think about cumulative recall across the chain, what aspects of stories are passed on down the chain, 
uh, what parts of the story are preserved through transmission and what changes are introduced, if any. So it's a kind of micro society experiment that allows us to examine some of these uh, questions around cultural transmission. And there's a good way of, ex of uh, testing for the biases I'll be talking about. The, the first of the content biases that I'm going to be discussing will be minimally counterintuitive or MCI bias. I thought this was a good to, one to start on because we're getting close to Halloween and this is essentially the kind of spookiest bias that I'll be talking about. So it's really used to explain why uh, across cross-culturally we have such a, a high number of supernatural tales. So tales of the supernatural are highly successful culturally, all kinds of examples of those like fairy tales, ghost stories, myths and legends, uh, you know, religious legends and all those kind of things. And MCI bias was uh, kind of part of a, an explanation of why we might have these stories about the supernatural. And the basic, basic kind of idea behind it is that humans have basic intuitive assumptions around about the world around us. So these include folk biology, folk physics, and folk psychology. And uh, based on these categories, we have certain expectations or assumptions about um, things with concepts within these categories. So we would ex we expect living things in order uh, to require sustenance in order to survive. We would uh, expect solid things to fall if they were dropped, or that they cannot occupy they can't co-occupy the same space. Two solid objects. We expect uh, individuals, sentient beings, to be limited in their knowledge to what they have experienced themselves. So we have these intuitive assumptions around the world around us and these category level expectations. But the uh, folk tales and myth and legends and all these kind of stories feature concepts which breach these category level expectations very commonly. And concepts which breach these expectations are known as counterintuitive. So we might have animals that can talk or humans that transform into animals or creatures that can, you know, solid uh, beings which float above the ground or beings which have knowledge of the future or knowledge of other humans' minds far beyond what they have experienced themselves. But not all counterintuitive concepts are created equally and it's not just a kind of additive process where the more counterintuitive is something is, the more memorable it is. So if we had an invisible ladder versus an invisible weightless ladder that can read minds and talk while being in two places at once, it's the invisible ladder which is likely to be more successful and more memorable. There's this idea that there's a kind of sweet spot between intuitive concepts which are comprehensible and counterintuitive concepts which gather attention, hence minimally counterintuitive. So the idea is that uh, concepts are successful, counterintuitive concepts are successful if they are in the minority relative to a range of different intuitive concepts. One of the studies that examined this with folk tales was uh, Birdetta al um, from about a decade ago. And they took a, a selection of uh, cross cultural selection of folk tales and then coded them for counterintuitive items within them. So a, a nice selection of folk tales from uh, different areas. And essentially they gave a, a score, a counterintuitive score for these different concepts that were within the folk tales. So you have things that are entirely intuitive, like a brown horse with four legs and a long tail. And then things which are much more counterintuitive, like a dead woman who comes back to life and takes off her head only at night. Uh, and these are all coded by independent coders, and they found that the vast majority, so almost all of them, 99% of the tales, had a counterintuitive score of one to two, or the concepts within them. So this supports this idea of the what is culturally successful is something which is minimally counterintuitive, so not, not excessively counterintuitive, and not too intuitive, not exclusively intuitive, but this minimal amount of counterintuitiveness is what is culturally successful in folk tales or traditional folk tales. And this has been supported by a number of different studies using the transmission chain design that I mentioned earlier, also individual recall experiments suggesting um, an advantage for MCI bias in individual recall. And this has led some to suggest that there's an optimum number of cognitive uh, uh, counterintuitive elements, a cognitively optimal number. So Burdett from their work on folktales suggested uh, 
have got a cognitive optimum of one to two and Noren Zion and colleagues have suggested two to three. So broadly, there seems to be a, counter, uh, a cognitive optimum of about one to three counterintuitive element. But I was interested uh, in my research in thinking quite how exactly how the MCI bias operates within a narrative and whether it's uh, a function of individual concepts within the narrative and that the individual concepts would have a transmission advantage, whereas the intuitive, can, the intuitive concepts around them might change as, uh, as the stories are transmitted, or whether they would come as a kind of package and that the, the MCI bias would create a, an advantage for the narrative as a whole. So to test this, I looked at the, the urban legend of Bloody Mary. So this is a, a relatively well-known urban legend, especially in the USA. But for those who are not familiar with it, the, the basic idea, or a kind of simple version, is it involves a, a kind of summoning ritual, usually saying the name of the ghost, so like Bloody Mary, saying it three or four, you know, a few times in front of a mirror. So it involves some kind of ritual that's performed in front of a mirror that summons this figure, Bloody Mary, in most versions, and then that ghost will do some kind of horrific violence on the person that summoned them. So it's actually thought to have, Bloody Mary is an urban legend, is thought to have its origins in older mirror divination kind of folklore. So there are, there's folklore from the UK based around Halloween that uh, unmar unmarried women could see the face of their future husband by performing a mirror ritual. Uh, but if they, were if they were never going to get married or they were going to die unmarried then they would see the face of the grim reaper or some kind of uh, horrific figure so this it was a, a mirror divination folklore that featured the accidental summoning of a horrific figure and this has been suggested as a kind of precursor to bloody mary the modern legend comes from uh, post-war america the earliest published version being in the mid 70s although it certainly existed for decades before then and you see a lot quite a lot of uh, variation, different names for the ghost. There's a, a localized version to Nashville, which features the Bell Witch, a kind of local uh, folkloric figure. And we see a whole international range of different Bloody Mary versions across uh, Europe, North America, and also East Asia. It's also inspired quite a, a range of different um, and quite awful horror films as well. So as part of this study, uh, the idea was that we would create a, uh, a phylogenetic reconstruction uh, similar to what was done with Red Riding Hood by Jamie Tarani. So for this, we've collected 45 different uh, variations of the Bloody Mary tale. And for, for this purpose, we just defined a kind of Bloody Mary tale type as any contemporary tale featuring the deliberate summoning of a supernatural figure using a mirror. So each from these uh, different variations, 36 plot variables or characters were coded as present or absent. This is uh, part of what's required for this phylogenetic reconstruction. And this included the number of phrase repetitions. So it might be three, five, a whole range of different uh, of those. Some, some aspects of the supernatural figure that summoned, the kind of background story of the ghost variations within this, the nature of victim uh, injury on the victim uh, and different things like this. We also coded these for either being counterintuitive according to those prior definitions, so such as the, the figure appearing out of a mirror, out of a, a physical object, and also intuitive ones, such as it just taking place in the bathroom. So in terms of how it fit with that cognitive optima idea, we found that a range of one to four counterintuitive concepts. Most of these, uh, most of the stories featured one to three, so it, it does fit with that uh, previous work suggesting a fixed cognitive optimum. Um, and then, it, but in terms of the phylogenetic reconstruction, we're able to assess the stability of transmission across the evolution of the story. Uh, and essentially in this way, they found no significant difference between counterintuitive and intuitive concepts as the, uh, along the transmission, suggesting that they're equally stable in transmission. Um, so this does suggest that the MCI bias seems to work as a function of the whole narrative, creating a kind of successful package of the narrative rather than the individual concept uh, within it. So uh, no inherent transmission advantage across the evolution of the, of the individual counterintuitive concept, but they depend on the narrative context in which they're transmitted. And this is consistent with some other work by Upal, 
uh, who uh, has kind of questioned this specific cognitive optimum and, and has emphasized that actually what's important is uh, the cohesion of the narrative. So a cognitive optimum of one to three uh, may not be correct, but what's important is the narrative cohesion. So in terms of how else they are reflected in other urban legends, uh, conducted this other study which involved collecting urban legends randomly from Snopes.com using the randomizer function. So I'll just say as well that this is from quite a few years ago. So it's uh, when we collected those legends. So it's kind of before Snopes become became this much more uh, this kind of fact checking of political rumors, and it was a, a lot more focused on urban legends. I think uh, if we did it now, you get many more. Uh, about half of them would be about Donald Trump. So it's quite uh, so it's before that kind of uh, shift in Snopes.com. And these. The urban legends we collected were coded for the presence of bias exploiting content. So a whole range of different biases, one of which was MCI. And the, the number of counterintuitive features in the stories we collected uh, that were MCI was one to two. So it does fit with that prior work um, with the majority just featuring one MCI concept, but they were also the least frequently coded of, of any of the biases we looked at. So only 6% of the urban legends featured MCI. So certainly in terms of, of frequency, it seems like urban legends um, don't feature MCI content that much. In terms of fake news, uh, a bit more recent study by Alberto Acerbi, who has just been uh, doing an, an online seminar covering this work uh, earlier today. I don't know if anyone caught that. But uh, so he uh, did a similar, a similar study to what I did with Urban Legends, but with fake news articles. So collected a whole, a nice sample and then coded them for the presence of biases. But again, so similar to the Urban Legends found that uh, MCI was uh, pretty low. So this is interesting uh, in comparison to, I guess, traditional folklore, which features a lot more in terms of MCI content. Why that is, is, is I guess, open to speculation. One thing might be that it's just a kind of genre related thing and that fake news and urban legends have a higher level of kind of expectation of credibility. Another feature could just be age. Uh, fairy tales tend to be much, much older than urban legends and fake news. And it might be that the urban legends and fake news which exploit MCI bias will survive for a hundred years, even though they're rarer at the moment. Um, but yeah, there's an open question, but interesting comparison across the different types of folklore. Okay, so the, the next bias, um, uh, content bias I'm gonna be talking about is for emotional content. So we know that uh, from you know, lots of good work on in psychology that emotions are very important for, our, uh, for storage and recall of memories. It's a whole kind of field of work on this uh, across different emotions. So we could expect that emotions will be uh, likely to be important in terms of the cultural evolution and transmission of uh, folk tales and other narratives. So uh, one of the ones that was kind of looked at with folk tales in terms of urban legends is a bias for disgusting content. So obviously, if you're familiar with urban legends, you probably, if you're thinking of one, you can probably think of one that's fairly disgusting. The, the picture here is one with someone who has uh, spiders growing in their face. But Heath and colleagues, did a transmission chain study uh, and they found that more disgusting urban legends were more successfully transmitted or more faithfully transmitted along chains. And they also did an assessment of uh, the distribution of urban legends online and found that disgusting urban legends were successful. This was expanded on by Ericsson and Kultus who also looked at urban legends, but rather than different urban legends, they manipulated urban legends to create versions of the same story which had different levels of disgust. So for example, ones which were high in disgust. So uh, with Jasmine found that the flower she had used was infested with maggots uh, and then also kind of low or no disgust equivalent. So in this case, Jasmine tasted the cake mix and found it tasted better than ever. So they looked at these in a transmission chain design to kind of test for a, a bias towards disgust at different levels. And they found that the, the more disgusting variations, the more disgusting it was, the more successfully they were transmitted uh, across these chains. 
in terms of how disgusting content is reflected in fake news, so uh, Vesugi and colleagues in their um, science article on fake news, the transmission of it, they, they found that disgust was among the common emotions that were exploited by fake news. In uh, Alberto Atribi's assessment, he found about 15% elicited disgust, which might, may sound relatively low, but when compared to genuine news stories is quite high. Genuine news tends not to uh, elicit disgust in the same kind of way. But obviously disgust is not the only emotion which is evoked by folk tales. And I was interested in assessing if there's a, a general bias for emotional content. So whether, so a lot of these, um, a lot of this research which looked at a, a disgust bias, the argument was that the reason why you see this advantage is because disgust is more emotive than uh, the relative content. So it was interesting in examining emotional bias as a general phenomenon. So again, used urban legends as material and there it had uh, different urban legends that varied in the emotions that they evoked. So some include uh, evoked disgust, but others evoked amusement and surprise uh, and so on. And through a, a pretest validation, had ones which were highly emotive, uh, a kind of high emotion urban legends, and ones which were less so, so low uh, emotive urban legends. And that was uh, validated prior to the transmission chain study. And they're also the validation meant that they were varied as little as possible in terms of other biases. So essentially, uh, found that the in the transmission chain, high emotion legends showed greater transmission fidelity than low emotion legends. I guess, interestingly, there was no effect of valence, so there was no, and also no particular advantage for disgust. So it did seem to suggest that what the advantage for these disgusting legends was that they were highly emotive, not because they were disgusting necessarily. Um, so it's, it was kind of evidence that it's the level of emotion is what is important rather than a specific emotion or a specific valence. Uh, in terms of how it's reflected more generally in urban legends, so going back to that study with the, the sample, I actually found that amusing content was the most frequently coded emoji in, uh, uh, emotion in urban legends, much more so than discussed. They can obviously coexist and, uh, and often do, but um, in generally uh, amusing content was more common. Also, interestingly, in a, a follow-up study, Ericsson, Kultus and Dabara kind of replicating their uh, disgust bias found that in a, an Indian sample compared to the a US sample, uh, disgust wasn't, uh, didn't have an advantage, but amusement had a, a success in both. So it just seemed that there's a kind of general emotional uh, phenomenon that more emotive stories are more successful. And it might be that those are funny stories, it might be those are disgusting stories. Um, but actually the, the importance of valence, especially kind of positivity versus negativity is a bit unclear. And there is uh, some nice work suggesting negativity bias. So Bebbington at Al also with the transmission chain design, but with material that was created exclusively for that experiment, uh, looked at negativity bias. And so they had a, a story about a woman flying to Australia, which uh, featured uh, positive statements, like the, the character being moved up to business class, negative statements like being sat next to someone with a negative cold, uh, a nasty cold, and also ambiguous statements which may be interpreted either positively or negatively. Uh, so for instance, uh, the character seeing a young man take an old woman's back, which could be interpreted as stealing or helping her. They found that in transmission, that the, the negative events, the negative statements within that story uh, were more faithfully transmitted in the transmission chain. They also found, I think particularly interestingly, that the ambiguous statements, when they were resolved to become either positive or negative, they were much more likely to be resolved as a negative event. So it does suggest a kind of negativity bias in transmission. Now that we don't know in these whether they were more, the negative events were more emotive or not, but there does seem to be some advantage for negativity. In terms of how uh, negativity, the valence is um, reflected in fake news, Alberto looked at that uh, and found that there was in fake news far more negative, uh, I mean, not that much more than neutral content, but certainly compared to positive content, much more negative content than um, positive content. 
So there does seem to be some advantage for uh, negatively valenced content in transmission or in the in uh, in folk tales across different uh, types. But why would there be an advantage for uh, negativity? So one of the arguments is essentially a kind of evolutionary one, which is that we uh, should have evolved to pay more attention to and remember negative aspects of our environment because it's more costly to miss something which is negative than which is positive. And this kind of relates to the, the next bias which I wanted to talk about, which is uh, related to survival threats. So the, the general idea is that we have a negativity bias as a kind of generalization of a bias for uh, potentially threats to our survival or threats to fitness within the environment. So there's some interesting work uh, looking at individual memory, uh, which does suggest a, an advantage for ecological survival information, and that, that human memory may be tuned towards encoding fitness-related information, such as uh, location of food sources or predators. So a lot of this has been done by uh, Nairn and colleagues, although others as well, and they developed this, um, uh, what they call survival processing. So this is in experiments, people will be asked to imagine themselves in a, a survival situation and then asked to rate objects in terms of their relevance to their survival in that situation. And they found uh, that this process uh, imbues uh, a strong uh, advantage to uh, recall. And that's more so than uh, other forms of processing, like rating the pleasantness of words, which have shown to also be very successful in terms of enhancing memory. So there's quite a lot of work now uh, by that group and others that have, have found this advantage for survival processing, which suggests that there may be a kind of tuning of human memory towards this kind of information, which again might suggest a, a bias in transmission. Uh, related in terms of how it might be reflected in uh, transmission, social transmission of information. Blaine and Boyer have a, a nice experiment where they're interested in examining the, the social transmission of danger related rumors or threat related rumors. So this, rather than looking at folklore explicitly, although it's obviously uh, relevant to folklore, um, the, the material they used in their experiment was a consumer, well, a range of different consumer reports. And this is an example of one uh, where it's related to an acne cream and it contained uh, threat related information, such as it, the, the cream would burn if applied to certain skin types, ne kind of negative information, which wasn't related to threats, such as it having a strong smell and then also neutral information. So in their experiment, they had a, an interesting variation on the a transmission chain design. So rather than being recall based, this was explicitly just selection based. So you would have a list of these different items <clears throat> starting with eight, and then you would select uh, seven of these items to be passed on to a friend in the experiment. So uh, through that process, this selection based process rather than memory based, the, it would create the material and so down the chain uh, and create a new kind of uh, consumer report. So essentially they found that the, there was a strong advantage in selection, uh, this selection based chain for threat related information. So people were more likely to pass on the threat related information than the negative, just the kind of more general negative information. The negative information still had uh, an advantage you know, suggestive of a bias over the just straight neutral information, but it does seem that there's an advantage for threat related information. So it might be that some of the negativity bias work, uh, maybe it's reflecting of uh, a bias for threat related information rather than just general negative valence. In terms of how these are reflected in folk tales, uh, in urban legends and that kind of uh, content analysis that I did, the uh, ecological survival information was found in about a third of the urban legends, slightly less than a third. And I divide this into two different levels of kind of uh, intensity. So some of it concerning serious injury or death and uh, others just concerning uh, lesser injury or potential injury. Basically the, those that contains high survival information 
the, the serious injury were the majority of these. There's also been suggestions from people who work on uh, the oral tales of foraging peoples that these, these tales are used to transmit survival related information about predators and uh, food sources. So it certainly seems to be uh, a relatively common bias that's reflected in folk tales of a range of different types. Uh, in terms of uh, survival threats in, in fake news, uh, in Alberto's uh, content analyses, similar to the how it came out in Urban Legend, about a third of these were threat related. And so you'd feature you know, fake news about serial killers or um, bombers and sexual offenders was relatively common. About a third of these were related to threats. So again, reflecting this kind of uh, potential content bias for survival related information. So I think in terms of thinking why we might see uh, this particularly related in fake news, but perhaps also urban legends, have a look at these two different statements and see how you uh, perceive them and see what you think is more believable. So the first statement is, despite their fierce appearance, German Shepherds are considered loyal and intelligent pets. A recent study in the US notes that other breeds of dog are responsible for 89% of dog attacks. Okay, and so uh, the second statement, although proponents consider German Shepherds loyal and intelligent pets, a recent study in the US notes that this breed of dog is responsible for 11% of dog attacks. So uh, the perceptive amongst you will probably have spotted that this is this essentially the same statistic, which is either being framed positively uh, or frame negatively in terms of more uh, of a threat to our survival. And both of these statements are from uh, an experiment by Fessler et al from a few years ago. They're interested in terms of how uh, the framing of information, the framing of statistics influences how likely people are to believe them. So they had a range of different items similar to that where essentially the same information was framed positively or negatively. So in terms of, uh, and often in terms of a threat. And participants were asked to rate these of how likely they thought they were to be true. And they found that participants were more likely to believe information, and obviously this is the same information, but they were more likely to believe that information if it was framed negatively, um, which I think uh, so we might see that you know, when it's framed negatively as a threat, there seems to be an advantage in terms of credulity, which might explain why we see threat-related information in particularly fake news. And I also think it's interesting in terms of thinking about how we uh, communicate health related risks and all kinds of different risks. Okay, so the, the uh, next bias that I want to talk about is uh, social information bias. So uh, this is probably uh, known to a lot of the people in this audience, I would have thought, but um, uh, some of the key theories around why humans and uh, primates are so intelligent relative to other animals is the social brain and the Machiavellian intelligent hypothesis. And this suggests that our intelligence evolved in order to form and keep track of relationships in complex social networks and also to enhance effective communication within the large groups in which humans live. A consequence of this, this social brain that is uh, suggested by uh, Masudi and colleagues is that it would be disposed towards social information over equivalent non-social information. So essentially we'd have a content bias for social information and that we'd be susceptible to content which exploits this bias, which also uh, would include uh, fictional social relationships in, in stories like folk tales. And they uh, demonstrated this in uh, another transmission chain experiment, again with uh, material that was created for uh, a study featuring, so it was a, a vignette about uh, the kind of a day in the life of a, uh, of a student. And they found that social information, uh, uh, they found that social information was advantaged in this transmission chain. So it was more uh, successfully or faithfully transmitted along the chains. Kind of interestingly, in terms of thinking about the nature of the transmission of social information, they had 
two different types of social information. So kind of just general social information about the interaction uh, between people. But they also had uh, social gossip. So a kind of higher level, more intense relationships. So in one of the, in their story, uh, the, the student had an affair with a professor. So that was the kind of social gossip level. But what's interesting is that actually the, the gossip was transmitted no more faithfully than the social information. So both of these had a relatively uh, equal level of advantage over the equivalent individual or physical information. In terms of social information and how that's reflected in the kind of corpus of urban legends, it was uh, one of the most frequently coded biases that I found. So about 77% of the legends featured some kind of social information. I divided this into different levels. So uh, social context where it wasn't the, the, uh, the kind of key plot points weren't necessarily related to social information, but there was context. Social where the key plot points were related to social interaction and social gossip, uh, which reflected the same kind of definitions as the Masudi paper. Also, so essentially found that social information where the, the key parts of the plot were related to social interaction was the most frequently coded of these different levels. And again, and interestingly, I guess, reflecting what was found in the Masudi paper, social gossip was actually relatively low. In fake news, uh, it was uh, found to be very strong uh, in fake news with uh, social interactions and gossip covering about half and uh, celebrity content being very high as well. Celebrities being a kind of people within our social networks, essentially, even though we've never met them. All the, all the research I've been talking about really uh, has examined individual biases, has tested for individual biases, and has tended to compare them against uh, neutral or uh, control material to test if these biases have a, a generally successful in transmission. But I was curious uh, to see what would happen if you put two uh, material which exploited competing biases against each other. What was what would be su more successful, or would they be equally successful in transmission? And also because uh, folklore, folk tales, will not just exploit a single bias. What happens if you combine different biases together? Is there a kind of additive effect? Will they have? Uh, will they be even more successful if they combine multiple biases? So to do that, I looked at uh, two, I, th I caught, thought, interesting biases to compare because they come from essentially, they're derived from predictions of two kind of competing theories of the evolution of human intelligence. So I looked at social information bias and survival information bias. I wanted to test these two against each other in transmission, but also what would happen if you combined both within uh, a vignette to see how that successful, how that would influence the transmission. I was also curious to break down the transmission into three separate phases. So thinking about people's choice to receive information, uh, the en encode and retrieve phase, kind of memory-based phase, and then people's choice to then transmit that information to others. So to do that, I used uh, Urban Legends. So this is an example of one of the survival related ones. So in this story, uh, Spider in the hairdo, a woman uh, has a beehive hairdo that she never takes down. One day she brushes up against a tree and later drops down dead. And when the doctors cut into her hair, they find that uh, it's been full of spiders that, and the, the spiders have uh, eaten into her brain or poisoned her or something like that. Now the beehive hairdo obviously kind of does show the kind of age of this urban legend, but I was, uh, Pleased to see very recently this year on TikTok exactly the same urban, urban legend being passed around, but it's braids rather than a beehive hairstyle. But so it's still being preserved in, in transmission. Oh, just a point, I, I didn't use these cartoons in the actual experiment. This is just to kind of illustrate the story that I used. I used text. One of the social information ones uh, was a, a boss who um, is in, on his birthday invited to go back to his attractive secretary's apartment. She excuses herself uh, to slip into something more comfortable and he takes the opportunity to take all his clothes off. Then it turns out to be a surprise party and he's caught by <coughs> his friends and family in nothing but his socks. Then a version that combined 
both types of information. Uh, this is a story about a woman hearing a baby crying and then she calls the police and but they tell her they warn her not to go outside to help the baby because it's actually a serial killer who's using the uh, the recording of a baby crying in order to coax women out of their homes so they can kill them. So this combines both social and survival information. So in the in the transmission chain experiment, we found that the the legends which combine some kind of social information uh, were particularly successful in transmission. Um, so they were more success, more faithfully transmitted than the survival related. Uh, the survival information legends, although the survival information legends were more successfully, more faithfully transmitted <coughs> than uh, the control material. We can also see that combining the two didn't seem to have any particular advantage. And this may be something of a ceiling effect here, um, but there was no strong kind of additive effect. And actually, uh, so the the ones that had some kind of social information, whether that was combined with survival or not, were essentially equally faithfully transmitted along the chain. So that was kind of to look at the encode and retrieve. This was a memory-based transmission chain that was there to look at that phase of transmission. In terms of thinking about the more selection-based um, aspects of transmission, in a separate experiment, we had uh, looked at these choose to receive and choose to transmit phases. So for choose to receive created headlines representing the different stories and participants were asked to then uh, read the headlines and then put them in order based on their interest in reading the story behind that headline. They then read the urban legends, uh, read the different stories in a random order, not the, the, the order they had um, uh, specified. And then they were asked to then order those stories in their preference of passing them on to another person. So interestingly, whereas there was an advantage for social information in this recall-based uh, encode and retrieve phase in, in the trans recall-based transmission chain, there was no difference between the different biases in, in the selection uh, of either to receive or to transmit. So it just seemed that the, the biases are operating kind of equally in terms of selection of uh, to receive information, but then they have this advantage in recall, uh, but then in terms of transmission, when you know they have a they are equal in transmission as well now the advantage in recall for social information would give it an overall advantage in recall based transmission and certainly oral transmission uh, but it's interesting to see how these biases may operate differently across different phases of transmission and so that's the kind of current I, I guess status of um a lot of this work on content biases and how it's uh, related to um the kind of cultural evolution of folk tales um, I'd also like to talk about some interesting new directions that uh, could be taken. So one, of course, is thinking about context biases. Thus, all this work has looked at content biases. There's a lot of great work on context biases, and obviously both of these are going to have an impact on the cultural evolution of uh, folk tales. So we could look at the relative importance, whether context is more, more important than content, or how they might interact. So one study that uh, I conducted with some people that kind of gets at this a bit, but, uh, but not quite, was looking at the transmission of um, both pro and anti-vaccine messages. So we had a kind of prestige model, which was a doctor who had a, an expertise-based account uh, versus the account of a parent who, uh, which was more experience-based. They found the experience-based message was more faithfully transmitted than the, the medical, the medical uh, message provided by the doctor perhaps suggesting a, a lack of uh, prestige bias in this case, um, but we can't separate the, the nature of the model from the nature of the content in this case. And it could be that if the parent was perceived as being more similar, it could still be a context bias, which was uh, driving this difference in the, in the transmission along the chain. Something which looks at, a study which looks at it more explicitly uh, is uh, this work by Berlin colleagues, which is, is currently a preprint. So it's uh, just uh, came out this August as a preprint, it's not yet published. But they were particularly interested in looking at the effects of high or low prestige models and how that interacted with content biases within a, a folktale. So they looked at content. Uh, so a lot of the biases that I've been talking about 
in this talk, social information, survival information, and so on. <clears throat> and they also used uh, creation stories. So, because they felt that these would be rich in the kind of content which is relevant to cultural transmission. Uh, and looked at the relative importance of these different aspects in uh, salience and recall. And they found that prestige uh, was significant in terms of enhancing the salience of recall of the story. But a number of the content biases, uh, so social information, survival information, negativity, and uh, biological and minimally counterintuitive information was actually more influential on the salience uh, and recall of this content than the context biases. So this is first really the kind of first kind of work uh, comparing these two and particularly the first work finding, suggesting that content bias may be more important in cultural evolution than context bias, at least in the context of these kind of narratives. So another thing I think would be uh, interesting to look at more in future is kind of this, particularly this phase of transmission. So thinking about the selection choices people make in terms of what to transmit to other people and how the nature of audiences can influence that. So there's some, some quite uh, old work looking at how uh, communicative intent can actually influence the nature of um, content as it's transmitted to others. So prior, prior work, you're know, going back to the 1940s, has suggested that uh, stories which were consistent with stereotypes around uh, race or gender were more successful uh, in transmission. But this study by Lyons and Kashima found that this was only the case in, in chains which had communicative intent in, in, in uh, uh, that participants knew that what they were producing from memory was going to be passed on to another person. They compared this to with ex explicitly uh, cumulative recall chains where participants were just thought they were a part of an individual recall uh, experiment. Uh, basically found in the recall based or the, the recall chains without communicative intent no stereotype bias kind of emerged and it only emerged where in the chains where people knew there, the information was being passed on to another person. Um, so kind of similarly in a, a study I looked at uh, where looking at the transmission of moral information found no advantage for moral content in individual recall, recall being better predicted by some of the other biases I've talked about. <clears throat> but in chains where people knew the information was being passed on to uh, another person, we found that content uh, which was rated more highly for morally good content, uh, explaining kind of virtue, was actually more successful in transmission, more faithfully transmitted. And this is perhaps related to another couple of studies looking at this choice to transmit. So work by Van Leuven, who found that people, participants, were more likely to choose to transmit positive low arousal vignettes. So quite against some of the bias, biases we've been talking about uh, when they knew they were passing this information on to strangers compared to choosing to transmit more negative high arousal vignettes when they were passing these on to friends. So they interpreted that as when people are seeking social support, they'd be more likely to, to transmit positive information than negative information. <clears throat> and, Similar to a very recent study that's also a preprint, uh, just came out this month by Alte and Mercier, found that people are more likely to share happier beliefs uh, when wishing to appear nice and kind rather than competent and uh, dominant. So when, and they also found that people were actually perceived as nicer and kinder when they were sharing this kind of more positive, happy content. So it just suggests that uh, people's choice to pass on information will be strongly influenced um, by who they are passing that information on to. So the nature of how these content biases uh, operate will uh, depend on the context of the transmission routes. So I think uh, based on that kind of recent work, uh, this does seem to be a potential distinction and I think it'd be something that could be explored a lot more uh, in dividing content biases between receiver biases, which are the product of encoding and the processing of individual brains and are likely to be present or demonstrated in individual recall experiments or recall based transmission chains may have an intention advantage as well. Uh, so um, kind of, I guess, key candidates for these being kind of social information bias, survival threat information and so on. 
<coughs> and uh, transmitter biases, which are the product of mechanisms of communication and transmission to other people. And that these biases would only emerge when there is communicative intent. And that these biases may serve a, a social function or emerge when there is a social function in pro, you know, such as promoting group cohesion. And that might include stereotype consistency, may include positive content or morally good content uh, as explained in those previous studies. Um, so that, that's everything. So uh, I'd just like to thank kind of all the colleagues that I've worked with on the studies I've been talking about that I've worked on, also all the people who worked on the studies that I wasn't involved in that I mentioned, uh, various funders, Cultural Evolution Society, and different places that have uh, employed me. And also there's, if you want to learn more about narratives uh, and cultural evolution approaches, there's the online learning module. Um, and th thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, this was very interesting. Sure. And we have uh, a number of questions here. Um, so I guess uh, the first one, uh, can you comment on cautionary tale bias? Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it, it's, it's, as, a, as an individual bias, I've not, I've not come across it, but I mean, I suppose cautionary tales you would would come under that kind of um, survival threat, I would have thought most of the time that they would come under that kind of umbrella in that they would largely feature uh, something unpleasant happening <laughs> to someone who did the wrong thing. So I, I imagine that it would be closely related or would be an example of the, the survival threat by a sort of negativity perhaps. Okay. And well, there is a couple of, uh, I think, uh, related questions. Uh, one is uh, about kind of pre-existing cultural references and how this affects biases. And another one is kind of related its on the differences between uh, folk tales, conspiracy theory, and fake news. They all have kind of a different relationship to uh, like real life. So how do these things interact with? Uh, you've been talking about so in terms of how they relate to real life um, yeah. yeah so I mean I guess what's interesting the the kind of key difference in terms of the biases I've talked about across the I guess the different types was um, MCI content uh, and that could be kind of about credibility I mean I think what's interesting in terms of conspiracy theories is that in some ways they may reflect some of uh, those kind of counterintuitive concepts to a, a greater degree than um, perhaps urban legends or in terms of frequency at least uh, and maybe fake news in that some of the kind of abilities or the the abilities that are kind of attributed to the kind of conspiring agents and conspiracy theories like essentially being all-knowing and being able to control people uh, uh, essentially the kind of attributes that uh, once attributed to you know gods essentially and I mean actually the the technology in a way now in terms of uh, being able to surveil people is probably catching up now with uh, what conspiracy theories have been saying people have been doing for years but you know this kind of ability to be constantly watching you by the Illuminati or something is uh, I, I think it could be considered MCI because really it's beyond what has been possible for a long time. Um, and I, I, I do think that there's an, an, you know, the, the use of, I think it's a nice illustration of that really is the, the eye of providence, the, the kind of triangle with an eye in the middle. I, and you know, most people probably be fairly familiar with that symbol in that you know, that was once symbolic of the all seeing eye of, of God, but it's probably more commonly recognized as a symbol of you know, the Illuminati now. So I think conspiracy theories maybe do, uh, well, I think there's some interesting differences perhaps between urban legends and fake news, which perhaps are more similar to uh, fairy tales uh, in terms of perhaps the biases they exploit and conspiracy theories, which maybe reflect more the biases we saw traditionally in religious mythology. Uh, but I think they're kind of contem you know, contemporary versions in a way of uh, and reflect you know, exploit the same kind of biases. But yeah, the the there's a much greater kind of immediacy uh, and I guess concreteness to urban legends and fake news. But similar in the way that fa fairy tales as well, going back, you know, they're about individual experiences, 
uh, relatively small scale versus these kind of stories which explain why the world is the way it is, like religious myths and conspiracy theory. Yeah, very, very so now a question uh, kind of related. Um, uh, can you link uh, or maybe characterize different uh, biases in terms of cultural fitness? And okay. again, it's related, I think, to utility or easiness of transmission. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, I, mean, I didn't mention it in, I guess, the future directions, but I think something that would be definitely really valuable would be looking at the particular cultural context and how biases may be more successful in certain contexts than others. So most of the work I've been talking about, I mean, I, I guess not the, not the, so much the traditional folk tales, but uh, particularly the um, urban legends, uh, conspiracy theories, fake news. You know, these are all you know, we, weird populations to use Joe Henrik's term, you know, kind of Western uh, educated post-industrial nations. So we might, you know, you might expect perhaps in cultures where we don't really have to worry about threats to our survival survival in our environment very much, it might be that we don't see very many stories about threats to their survival compared to perhaps uh, cultures and environments where those threats are more prevalent or more salient. Um, but really there hasn't been so I, I think it'd be great to look at that a lot more. Uh, there's not really been a whole lot of work comparing across, I think particularly it'd be interesting to look at those different kind of uh, ecologies, different uh, environments to see if there, if that is reflected in the tales or if it's the same, you know, it, it, it could be, I don't you know, it, it'd be interesting to see, but yeah, it, it, it's definitely a possibility, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, and yet another question related to context. So in, in real life, people might have different intentions and goals when we pass uh, inform, in information or consume it. And uh, it depends on the settings. And uh, for, for example, if there are some xenophobic group members uh, that prime one thing or uh, something about empathy, uh, when you prime a different way. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the tricky thing is all of this becomes, you know, like any kind of behavior is, is really complicated. So a lot of work on content biases is obviously focused on uh, testing for these biases and examining them. And so you, uh, you know, especially experimentally, you assume all other aspects to be fairly equal. In the real world, of course, you know, things are not going to be equal and people will have different motivations and that will influence uh, the nature of uh, the stories. I mean, they're still likely to reflect the kind of context biases have talked about, but it may be how they're framed and certainly you know, what they're about may be altered by the nature of that context. Um, I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about uh, that is very, very common, especially in conspiracy theories is thinking about in-group, out-group kind of uh, stuff and um, certainly kind of conspiracy theories and some urban legends uh, as kind of um, reflecting of outgroup negativity is is very very common indeed, and being uh, things that can exacerbate or at least reflect prejudice very common. Yeah, and, and there is a question about uh, possible links between uh, emergence of complexity science and some counterintuitive conclusions emerging, for example, in physics and the general perception of science uh, by general public. Right, yeah, in that some, some aspects of science yeah. would be essentially counterintuitive and maybe then more appealing, I guess that yeah. that would be, um, yeah, I, yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what the question, oh yeah, I guess, yeah, you, so you might expect there is aspects of science which, uh, or aspects of, I guess, theoretical physics, which are essentially counterintuitive would be appealing to the general public. I, 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 again, I don't, I'm not aware of, it sounds like something people might have tested, but I'm not, it, it doesn't ring any bells, but you know. Okay, yeah, we have several panelists uh, uh, here. I wonder if uh, any of you have some questions. Just uh, raise your hand. Yeah, Luke. I do, Sergey. Hi, Joe, thanks for this Hi. wonderful talk. I wanted to pick up on the very last thing that was raised. I added in the chat too. So there's Eric Carr had a nice question about the quantum mechanics. And the way I'd like to connect it is you focused a lot on the kind of processes of some 
selection or recall, but what about just generation? I think the, the link to like quantum mechanics is like, is it just that we're not even generating highly counterintuitive um, ideas? Like the variation isn't there, that basically the human mind when telling these stories would not even generate highly counterintuitive things. And, and you only see it happen in things like right, quantum mechanics where we've been pushed to come up with the idea of a P orbital, which doesn't make any intuitive sense to us. Um, or Justin Barrett, if you know his work, has suggested something similar about formal theology, that formal theology is full of highly counterintuitive ideas. Yeah. And that's why most, most religious beliefs, even by most Christians or Jews or whatever, don't really reflect formal theology very well. Because yeah. Yeah, I, I think like it explains, it potentially explains some of your null findings in the MCI studies, right? Like the variation that would be selected out isn't even generated by our mind. Yeah, yeah. So people just produce more counterintuitive <laughs> ideas or produce more intuitive ideas. Um, yeah, so I, I think, I guess something else that could be done more is looking at, uh, you know, generation and creativity in these stories and what the people produce if rather than just transmit. Um, so I did do a study which I didn't talk about uh, where uh, I was kind of interested in, I guess, you know, this is when I was working on urban legends and thinking about how urban legends might occur or become. Uh, so had, so this is less about uh, generation because this, it wasn't purely generative in that the participants had something to work with, but they were given new stories and were asked to edit them to make them as appealing as possible to another person. And that process did reflect very similarly uh, some of the kind of transmission chain work in that it, at least the stories which weren't very, um, the, the stories which weren't very appealing. So it didn't really see much change in, in the ones that which, were, which already were kind of interesting news stories didn't change much. Because, uh, you know, they'd be like news stories about, I can't remember what it was now, but you know, like tigers and stuff, like kind of weird news stories. But the ones that were essentially quite boring were elaborated on a lot more uh, and did reflect some of those biases. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly the kind of, there certainly was, I think, introduction of counterintuitive elements, um, but I think probably strongly in line with that kind of MCI uh, kind of idea. They didn't, they certainly didn't completely transform it into something which was vastly different but that might have been to do with the nature of the experiment in that they they viewed the nature of how much they could change the stories as limit you know so i think um certainly how these biases may be reflected in the kind of creation of stories and ideas uh i think is something that could be you know probably needs more work because ultimately these stories come from somewhere you know like they're not just you know they're, they're not just uh, around and transmitted at some point they are generated and i think how it could also be related to i guess what you were talking about the kind of academic processes of thinking beyond um our uh, you know intuitive experiences is also a really interesting avenue but yeah yeah yeah, there is a question about age differences in perception and spread of news, for example, uh, between teenage, what, what teenagers transmit and what retired people transmit. I mean, so I've not looked at this myself, uh, but I mean, I mean, I know this, I think there's been some work suggesting that older people are more likely to transmit fake news. I've not looked at this loads, though, so, I, I, you know, I, I think that has been found, but um, at least, you know, a greater propensity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that loads of the information is out, uh, you know. It, but yeah, I, I think there has been some age differences found, um, but I, it's not an area I've looked at particularly. I'm not sure, I mean, uh, I would suspect that that's not a reflection of, um, Con the kind of cognitive biases operating differently. Uh, they may, I think, probably context uh, and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's, there'll be a lot of stuff going on there in terms of the kind of information that is being passed on, particularly, I would guess, around political affiliation. Um, and I suspect it may be more driven by that necessarily than uh, biases being 
particularly appealing or that the appeal of bias is changing as someone ages. Uh, but I haven't looked at, uh, you know, I'm not aware of anyone looking at uh, age effects, particularly on uh, content biases. Okay. Yeah, but, oh, yeah. Andrew, Angie, yeah, please. You, you need to unmute me. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Joe. Um, Hi. When you're talking about cultural evolution uh, from a Darwinian perspective, which I guess, you know, we, we all are, um, there's kind of two different levels, if you like, at which you can do it. You can look in at the, the kind of fitness or ad ad adaptiveness for people uh, with the, you know, this bias or that bias. Uh, or you can look at it from the perspective of, of, of the meme, of, of the, uh, the actual narrative or, or whatever. You sometimes talked about um, uh, as kind of exploiting biases, you know, the stories are exploiting certain biases. Um, so you could almost think about it as a potential kind of arms race between you know, selfish meme and, and uh, you know, what's advantageous for people. I, I just wondered how you think about that. I mean, do you think of this as just two sides of the same same coin, or, or is, it, is it interesting to look at the kind of interplay between these? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess I don't necessarily see them as some as things that which would be in competition with each other. I mean, I guess so. Well, I get. I, I guess it, news. fake news might be good. You know. Yeah, I mean, I guess. It, it would be an interesting, yeah, where where the stories are having a negative impact on a society. Mm. Uh, but I guess I, I guess that is kind of a, <laughs> an empirical question as to what extent they are having, you know, at least in terms of fitness terms, I suppose. I mean, certainly storytelling as a behaviour. I think the I I can't remember the the study, um, but I think that there's been some work suggesting you know, like fitness benefits for uh, kind of storytellers and communities which tell stories and all this kind of thing. So there does seem to be a kind of benefit to uh, telling stories as a behavior. Um, and I, I would guess, mo but then if, if the stories themselves are having an, uh, an impact, I'm just not aware of uh, at least a research into uh, where they are in conflict as such mm -hmm. and i guess most you know it's an assumption that most stories throughout history are probably not having a hugely well i don't know it's, it's very difficult to say I, mean, I think it's probably a very modern you just assume it's probably a quite a modern uh phenomenon where you know like things like conspiracy theories have been used in um in uh, propaganda and horrific, you know, and the kind of horrific things associated with that for a, a fairly long time, you know, uh, and you know, particularly, you know, uh, conspiracy theories around the spread of disease has often been associated with the demonization of out groups. But I guess the maybe the in group, you know, I, I don't know. I think it'd be a complicated thing to look at, but it's certainly an interesting thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I've, I don't think there's a a decisive answer there, really, but an interesting idea where they could be in conflict. Um, yeah. Yeah, we have a, a number of other questions, but let me just pick up one final for you. Um, so what do you think uh, might be the implications uh, of the conclusions that you uh, get from studying folk tales and conspiracy theories for better understanding of how more comprehensive bundles of worldviews spread, like religious, philosophical, or political ideas? So uh, the kind of implications of content bias on the spreading of kind of whole yeah um, yeah yeah my my, my 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 much bigger sense of ideas um, I, yeah, I guess I, how political ideas or philosophical ideas or religious ideas become successful yeah i guess it's difficult to it's difficult to say because so much of what i've talked about focuses on narratives at a much smaller level <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, these yeah. are like little <laughs> stories that people might say exactly, tell each yeah. other you know uh around the fire or down the pub or you know would be like shared on twitter um yeah. and thinking and those individual stories might have a place within uh, a much wider narrative you know particularly within 
religious mythologies, you know, as, essentially mythology or, uh, you know, those kind of, they tend to, uh, they are smaller stories in a context of, of wider in, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, I, I think the, the kind of, I guess you, I, the question would be, I guess, to what extent those, those broad um, kind of com complexes of beliefs, are uh, the nature of the transmission of those uh, and to what extent they are transmitted as wholes or whether they are transmitted as into, you know, bits <laughs> you know, that come together. Uh, I, I don't know, it'd be, you know, it's interesting. It's slightly beyond um, what I've looked at. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. It, it's been great. And thank you everybody thank you. for coming today and uh, we hope to see you next week. Thank you and bye. Have a good day. Thanks very much.